Hello, everybody. This is the second lesson in the third week of the NPTEL course on the English Romantics. We have started exploring the fiction of the Romantic period, and our first author of study is Jane Austen. Jane Austen, 1775 to 1817, wrote at a time when many women authors had already appeared on the scene. She lived and wrote to the background of the French Revolution, the Napoleonic Wars, uh, in the period of radical and rapid changes in printing and publishing, and a slowly expanding British Empire. So she was actually writing to the intellectual and cultural backdrop also of the age of sensibility, where, as we have repeatedly been arguing, where to respond to the suffering of another was a marker of being human and of being civilized. She was undoubtedly influenced by this trend of thought, just as she was influenced by the writings of Samuel Richardson, Fielding, and Samuel Johnson. Our first slide now coming up on your screen is an illustration by Hugh Thompson, 1860 to 1920, from a chapter, specifically chapter 12, of Jane Austen's classic work, Sense and Sensibility, where Mr. Willoughby is cutting off a lock of Marianne's hair as a keepsake, a sentimental move. It's a famous illustration, and it's just to set the ball rolling. Writing in realist prose, but tinged very often with sardonic humor and deep irony, and concealing a deep understanding of the human ego and the dynamics of human relations, Jane Austen's novels were successful then, hugely successful then, and particularly successful in the 20th century, becoming the material for hugely successful TV series and film adaptations. Austen's principal themes have included romance, domesticity, but also property, class, and social order. There is a considerable amount of emphasis on manners, on social etiquette, and civil society. Domesticity and the home are also the sites of moral training. The distinguished critic Janet Todd has this to say about Jane Austen, and I quote, Moral purpose in the home and nation was essential to the war effort. In Mansfield Park, Austen presents the military and the church as the two serious professions that potentially support the country in a difficult and sapping time. Todd's is an important point. For those of you who think Jane Austen is only interested in questions of manners and frivolity and, and flirtation, here is Janet Todd who's making the point that she is addressing questions of the military and the church. Our first principal theme when we study uh, Jane Austen is women and marriage. Austen is traditionally known as a romantic because courtships and marriage are often central to her reading of the home and the social order. It's often that romance, courtship, marriage are caught up in a web of misunderstandings, but also caught up in larger issues such as poverty, questions of ownership and social obstacles. The courtship and the performance in civil society must be within the bounds, the norms as determined by the social order, and the woman must be conscious of her behavior. So Jane Austen's novels are quite similar to the conduct books of the period in their insistence on what was called proper behavior, a balance between prudence and romance, love and self-interest, I'm quoting Janet Todd here, is essential for the Austen heroines. Marianne's public behavior in Sense and Sensibility vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Willoughby is subject to criticism for being unfeminine. So this is what Eleanor says about herself. If there had been, and I quote, if there had been any real impropriety in what I did, I should have been sensible of it at the time. For we always know when we are acting wrong. Austen implies that Eleanor lacks a certain feminine virtue here because her search for what she calls irresistible passion, that's actually uh, Austen's words, irresistible passion causes her to behave badly. Being sentimental does not necessarily mean you put your sentiment out there for public display. You do not make a spectacle of your sentiment. The woman has to be interiorizing this. Here is your next slide which will tell us a little more about it. This is the excerpt from Sense and Sensibility. Up there, your slide, please watch. Eleanor could not be cheerful. Her joy was of a different kind and led to anything rather than to gaiety. Marianne, restored to he life, health, friends, and to her doting mother, was an idea to fill her heart with sensations of exquisite comfort and expanded in firm and gratitude. But it led to no outward demonstration of joy, no words, no smiles. All within Eleanor's breast was satisfaction, silent and strong. Affections, senses, sensibilities, falling in love, 
all of these are defined by social norms, limited by the social norms, particularly in the case of women. So the Jane Austen novel is actually not an exploration of the woman's emotions alone, but women's emotions as linked to the patriarchal setup which determine how much of an emotion or emotions uh, women can show. Her novels constantly interrogate the role of women within marriage as inheritors of property, but also as property. As we will see when we look at the famous, perhaps the most famous opening lines of any novel of this period in Pride and Prejudice. The women's role in observing the norms of society, often at the cost of individual development and progress, and subject to class and gender rules is also a key theme. That is, how does the woman grow? What and how are the restrictions of the social order impinging upon the woman's growth is a key theme in Austin. Are the women free to grow mentally, intellectually, uh, is a moot point. So this also implies that women's agency, desires, forms of expression are constrained by their roles assigned to them, whether it's within the family or within the social order. Thus whether Emma's character is nasty, arrogant and manipulative, is a departure from the role she's supposed to fit in as a woman, is a point to be considered. Uh, that is, whether Emma, universally liked or disliked depending on whose side you're on, um, her manipulative, arrogant behavior, is it truly feminine? In other words, what I'm urging you to look at is that the woman's character in Jane Austen must be read in terms of codes of conduct that are imposed upon her as to what constitutes the truly feminine. In the famous moment in Mansfield Park, Jane Austen even referenced current and controversial events such as slavery. Um, when the character mentions slavery, I long to talk about it. There's an utter silence at the dinner table. It's not spoken about, it's not discussed. This means the woman asking political questions is being unfeminine. So the gendered reading of the Jane Austen canon actually draws our attention to the problem that definitions of the feminine were invariably given by the social order and were restrictive. Now marriage as a theme occurs throughout her writings. Now while it's true that marriages appear to serve as the happily ever after logic, Jane Austen does leave enough clues to indicate that this may not be entirely true. Sometimes women get married to men who are, and this is Mr. Collins's description in Pride and Prejudice, conceited, pompous, narrow-minded, silly. And there is a suspicion that Willoughby has manipulated gullible women into marriage. Jane Austen's sense and sensibility concludes with the Dashwood sisters eventually settling for security and sobriety, particularly Marianne, instead of romance. That is, you move away from frivolous, flirtatious romance to stability. That's a model of marriage that is being proposed, that you separate your desire for romance from the necessity of social order. In a text like Emma, there's a tension between the sense of belonging a woman may choose or not choose to experience. Emma responding to Harriet, who has suggested that Emma might be an old maid, says, and this is Emma saying, I'm sure I should be a fool to change such a situation as mine. Fortune, I do not want. Employment, I do not want. Consequence, I do not want. I believe few married women are half as much mistress of their husband's house as I am of Hartfield. And never, never could I expect to be so truly beloved and important. That is, she's saying she does not want to abandon her spinster status because she has more power over the house than anybody else. This question of the power of the house and property is central to many Jane Austen texts. And that brings us to our next theme, individualism and property. In all major Austen novels, there is the loss or the threatened loss of home and property. Catherine Molland, Fanny Price, Anne Elliot, the Dashwood sisters, all of them have experienced some kind of threat to this uh, ownership of property that they may have. Susan Greenfield, in a lovely reading of the question of individualism and property, has proposed that each sister copes with a lack of personal property by imagining she has a large Lockean property in her person. She believes in her individuality. And it is the inner landscape, the inner property that they wish to cultivate. For Greenfield then, this is a major move. Individualism in the, is itself critiqued in Jane Austen. Greenfield argues that individualism is rarely available to those without property. And this is the key point, that for a person to be growing, within quotes, growing, to become a full-fledged human, to become an individual, you require property.
And in Sense and Sensibility, Jane Austen would give us a detailed exposition of this link between individual and property. Here is the famous opening lines of Pride and Prejudice. Coming up on your slide now. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single woman in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. What does this mean? It's a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. For the human male to be fully developed as an individual, you require two kinds of property. The property embodied in the land and the property embodied in the wife. In other words, Jane Austen is inaugurating the link between individualism and property where property is of two kinds. So the woman as the currency, the social currency of ownership, of individual growth, of male pride and of male individuality is the central theme. And surely that's a political argument. So in Susan Greenfield's reading, where she stands outside the insensible house, Marian consoles herself with sensibility. She cannot possess the house, but she can possess a superior sense of suffering. The point I'm making is, for women who do not have access to property, who are not owners, who cannot own property and display property, they begin to develop the property of the mind. So interiority is a response to the absence of physical, external, extrinsic property. The power of the imagination and the inner life of the woman is the key focus here. And that marks a withdrawal, necessary withdrawal because they aren't socially empowered, is the key. Janet Todd puts it well, and this is how Janet Todd defines it. Throughout the novels, the heroine's interior consciousness is presented as an interactive, as interactive with her physical being, cultural influences, and external forces. The point is, Jane Austen's novel does encode real life situations, linked to money, value, promise, and converts it into a fictional romance. Critics like Mary Poovey, who have examined the role of money and currency in Pride and Prejudice, note how Jane Austen's is a non-referential aesthetic. That's uh, Mary Poovey's term where the language refers to itself and not to any identifiable real event. Here is a longish excerpt coming up on your slide from Mary Poovey. That's the slide for you to read. Like the breach of promise that Elizabeth associates with the resolution to thank Darcy, the event that brought the situation to a head, the passage in May of the Bank Restriction Act, sanctioned a breach of promise. The act allowed the Bank of England to ignore the promise printed on the face of each of its notes to redeem paper notes with gold. So the Bank Restriction Act in relieving the Bank of England of its obligation to pay disrupted what had previously seemed to be the referential nature of paper money. Mary Poovey argues that the breach of promise between humans is akin to the social context and the breach of promise by the Bank of England itself. Continuing this exploration of social order, property and individualism in Jane, Jane Austen, let's take a look at Sense and Sensibility, Barton Cottage and the Dashwood family. Coming up on your slide, is the description of, in the case of texts such as Sense and Sensibility, owning a cottage or owning a land is what gave you a sense of yourself, a sense of being you. What about those women who did not have a cottage like Barton Cottage? They hope to acquire this via marriage. So property is linked to two specific landscape aesthetics, the prospect view, about which we will have something to say, and the question of control. Looking at a landscape spread out before you, vast rolling meadows, fields, is what John Barrell referred to as a prospect view. The prospect view is central to how you visualize your property. That is, you stand at a higher level and look down at the land and say, that land is mine. It makes you believe that this expanse of land is what constitutes you because you are at the center of it. So the question of a prospect view, which is about the gaze, is actually also about financial prospects. So John Barrell's account of the prospect view is intimately linked to questions of property and ownership. It's also loaded, of course, with sentiment. You only look at it with pride because you own it. Now here is a very well-known description of a prospect view in Pride and Prejudice. Coming up on your two slides is a description of Pemberley in Pride and Prejudice. Here is Elizabeth encountering for the first time this wonderful landscape of Pemberley. It's woods, it's park, and it's um, large landscape before it looks at uh, the house itself. They entered it at one of its lowest points. 
and drove for some time through a beautiful wood, stretching over a wide extent. Elizabeth's mind was too full for conversation, but she saw and admired every remarkable spot and point of view. And here's the description. They ascended for half a mile and then found themselves at the top of a considerable eminence where the wood ceased. And I was instantly caught by Pemberley House, situated on the opposite side of a valley. Please remember what I have said. A prospect view is where you stand here and look at the land stretched out. You stand at a higher level. Now here, this is what Austin says. You stand at the top of an eminence and you look down at Pemberley House set in a valley. A large, handsome stone building standing well on rising ground and backed by a ridge of high woody hills. In front, a stream of some natural importance was swelled into greater but without any artificial appearance. Elizabeth's thoughts are recorded. She had never seen a place for which nature had done more. They descend the hill. They cross the bridge and drove to the door. That's there on your next slide. She looks at the setting, the building, and walks to a window. And what does she do there? Here is your prospect view. Elizabeth went to a window to enjoy its prospect. Please recall what you said about the prospect view. The hill crowned with wood from which they had descended, receiving increased abruptness from the distance, was a beautiful object. Every disposition of the ground was good, and she looked on the whole scene, the river, the trees scattered on its banks, and the winding of the valley, as far as she could trace it with delight. She's looking at the sweeping expanse of land, okay? As they passed into other rooms, these objects were taking different positions. But from every window, there were beauties to be seen. From every window, there were beauties to be seen. The rooms were lofty and handsome. The furniture suitable to the fortune of the proprietor. And then she concludes, and of this place, thought she, I might have been mistress. The control over servants, fish, trees, and lands is precisely the key point here. Now do you think Jane Austen is writing only domestic fiction? Do you think Jane Austen is only interested in women's sentiments, uh, conversations of a very frivolous nature? No. What you can see when we decode the prospect view in the novels that we have looked at, Pride and Prejudice and Sense and Sensibility, Jane Austen is making very overt political statements that the woman's confidence in herself, the woman's sense of herself comes from either having property or acquiring it via marriage or by lineage. The question of the prospect view is therefore a question of the woman's self. Jane Austen in our reading of it therefore is a clearly political novelist. Her interest in questions of slavery, her question in interest of social order and social uh, issues such as the breach of promise by the Bank of England and of course the aesthetics of landscape appreciation are gendered and therefore her novels cannot be classified as simple gentle romances. Far from it in fact. Thank you.